Brilliant ideas, powered by Hyundai Motor. The contemporary art world is vibrant and booming as never before. It's a 21st century phenomenon, a global industry in its own right. Brilliant Ideas looks at the artists at the heart of this. Artists with the unique power to astonish, challenge and inspire. In this programme, artist Michael Craig Martin. Michael Craig Martin has always been a radical. In the 1960s and 70s, he was at the vanguard of conceptual art in Britain. In the 80s and 90s, he nurtured a whole generation of rebellious young artists known as the YBAs, who went on to change the face of contemporary art. Why are you doing this to me, Mark? This is the kind of thing that complete strangers do that is really irritating. I don't think you can underestimate Michael's power as an educator. I think that was really what propelled us all to stardom and gave us the energy to, you know, do it our way. Further back you put it, the smaller it gets. But I think this looks good. Today, he's celebrated around the world for his vibrant and distinctive work, from drawings and paintings to sculptures and installations that challenge the way we see the world around us. First impressions of Michael Craig Martin's work is the incredible vibrancy of the colour. He has a real signature style. You know a Michael Craig Martin as soon as you see one. Multiplicity sums up what Michael is, really. His elusiveness is part of his strength. He's inexhaustible, really. He's a kind of pioneering American, Irish, British conceptual artist. But actually, he's many other things too. You know, he's a mentor, he's a curator, he's a teacher, and I think that's what makes him very, very important. I look at my own work and I know that I couldn't possibly do what I do now. It may, in a certain sense, look quite simple, but I could never have done it if I hadn't spent the last 50 years getting ready to do it. One of art's most original thinkers, he recently published a book on being an artist, in which he reflects on his remarkable life and what it takes to make art. I didn't sit down and write a book. For years I've been writing things about what I'm doing so that it clarifies it in my own head notes to myself, where I've thought that I've lived through something important. A lot of it came out of teaching and my desire to be able to speak to students clearly about things. More than 40 years after first arriving in the UK, Michael continues to shake things up. In 2015, he gave a new lease of life to the oldest open art show in the world, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. There's no doubt that the summer exhibition is extraordinarily eccentrically British. It's the equivalent of Wimbledon or the boat race. But there's a possibility of it redefining its place as an art event in Britain. So how did this Anglo-Irish-American maverick come to be at the heart of British culture? Born in Dublin in 1941, the son of Irish Catholics, at the age of four, Michael moved with his family to Washington, D.C., where he was brought up and educated. I grew up essentially as an American child. I was very interested in cars when they had fins, and I knew every car, I knew every model. I liked the look of the modern world. My first experience of works of art was actually in my local church. You know, there were stained glass windows and there were statues of the saints and there were paintings behind the altar. In the early 1960s, Michael attended Yale School of Art and Architecture. It was a period of dramatic change and new artistic movements from op and pop art to minimalism. The whole of the art world, the whole nature of what art was and what you could do was changing. As students, we used to go at least once a month down to New York and it was possible to drive there quite easily. I was immediately taken by the idea of people doing radical and wayward things. 
He was so lucky to be able to go to New York as a student and find these amazing movements in art, one after another, which made the New York art scene the center of the world. There were so many processes, so many materials, so many things that had never been tried. Every time you went to New York, there was another amazing exhibition. It was a really extraordinary time. In 1966, Michael returned to Britain. I had always nurtured an idea that there was this other life I had been meant to have, most likely in London. I wondered what it would be like. Like many artists of his generation, he combined his career with teaching. I had a wife and small child, and I needed, I needed to be able to make a living. So I thought the only way to do that was to find a teaching job in an art school. After writing to several, he eventually took up a post at Bath Academy of Art. The first thing that struck me when I came to Britain was there were very few galleries. So the art schools themselves compensated for the art world that was not there. It was an amazing situation of this kind of cocoon of very high achievement, but with no outlet. Michael came over to England at a very interesting time because there was a huge rebellion going on amongst the art student generation who were just asking all sorts of difficult questions. What happens in that time is really very, very important because all of the props of authority in virtually every field are being knocked away. By 1972, a whole generation were coming together called the New Art. You might have called it conceptual art, but in a way the word conceptual doesn't really begin to convey what was going on, because what they were doing was of course using all sorts of different materials, different modus operandi. And I think Michael was able to benefit from that, but at the same time to analyze it in that way that he has, to be quite philosophical about it. My interest has always been objects in things. I like the thingness of things. I had been making constructions out of plywood, which were the box pieces. Richard Cork was one of the first British critics to encounter Michael's work. I was struck immediately by how unpredictable he was. One minute there'd be boxes that, strangely enough, didn't seem to be able to be opened. And the next minute, I'd be confronted by a mirror. Uh, but instead of finding my own reflection in the mirror, it would be a face of somebody else. Michael's work at that time placed him at the heart of an emerging group of British conceptualists. It was just at this point when the art world broke open in Britain in terms of new processes and materials. And that body of work culminated in 73 with the oak tree. I'll never forget finding this wonderful exhibition at the Rowan Gallery. There didn't seem to be anything in it. And I remember finally discovering this really quite small exhibit, and I thought, well, why is it called an oak tree? Is this an oak tree? No, but what's he playing at? It's a fairly simple point that um, the names we give to objects are simply our attempts linguistically to make sense of physical entities. And in, it, it doesn't alter the physical nature of something if you change its name, but it changes fundamentally our perception. So it's playing that philosophical linguistic game about object and naming and perception. In that period, there was a lot of speculation about what is the nature of art. And the oak tree was my attempt to answer the question. I had the idea, which I wouldn't have had if I hadn't grown up as a Catholic, where I was aware of transubstantiation, where something is profoundly changed without changing its appearance. And that became the basis of the idea that this was, in a way, the most profound change of all, was a change you couldn't see. And then I came up with this idea of the discourse, which is in the text. There's a skeptic and a lever. There's many ways of seeing this discourse. This provocative statement about the nature of art and perception enraged some viewers.
to a lot of people, it must have represented the end, really, of art. Um, and it was at a time when experimental modern art did actually get reviled. There are people who are really furious about the oak tree. And I obviously touched on some nerve when I tried to understand how that could be. It's because they take it so literally when my point is that you can't know, I can't prove I've done it and you can't prove I haven't. And it's like going to the theater, you need to suspend disbelief. To be honest, I knew when I did it that I had done something very special. But I couldn't see how I would ever in my life take a step directly beyond it. So over the next few years, I tried to find uh, another way to work. After the overwhelming reaction to his pioneering oak tree, Michael decided to push his ideas about representation even further. I decided to draw an object, and I drew it in pencil, and then I traced it in acetate. I liked that because I was able to make drawings that looked like they were machine-made, and I wanted the drawings to have the same character as the objects, because the objects are mass-produced. Anybody would be able to recognize whether you were in China or South America. So there is a universal language in these objects. And then I just started to draw one thing after another. And gradually, I started to develop a vocabulary of images. There is a sense that the hand has been removed. In a way, I think that was more a reaction to the art that had come before the 60s, particularly abstract expressionism, which was so obsessively about the artist's hand, about the personality of the artist thrown literally onto the canvas. So artists like Craig Martin in the 60s, when he started to work, were in a way defining themselves against that by refusing to have a personal style. The lines are completely artificial. There are no lines around things. Nothing in nature has any lines, so there's an interesting contradiction there. I think it's true with all his work that in one sense something can be almost banal and ordinary, and then you realise the more you look at what he's done, how very, very mysterious it is. Rather like, I suppose, the transformation from a glass of water to an oak tree. Not only was Michael creating shockwaves in contemporary art, but he was also helping to instigate radical changes to art teaching. In the late 1970s, he joined Goldsmiths College in London, where he became part of a progressive faculty of teachers. There, in the 80s and 90s, he went on to nurture an extraordinary generation of young British artists. Give it, Tony. I ain't got any money on skin completely. Okay. A samosa, coffee. I loved going to that school there. I knew what every student was doing. It was very, very easy to have a sense of things. And it was like a hothouse. We tried to adjust the school to fit what we knew to be the world in which we were living in as artists outside of the school. Michael's students included Julian Opie, Damien Hurst, Gary Hume, Sarah Lucas, and many more. If anybody did anything interesting, I would say, listen, you've got to go up to the third floor and see what Sons is doing up there. It's really interesting. There was a real sense of a kind of dynamics in the place. And of course, it also created competition and jealousy. So that if Gary Hume did something really wonderful one week, then somebody else was really determined to get into that position the next time. I got good at being able to tell when somebody wasn't being true to themselves. Michael respected you from day one, even though you were really making rubbish and wanted you to get better within yourself rather than get better to please him. With Michael, it was uh, an absolute commitment to all of us as separate people. 
That is one of the most important things you can do with young people who are trying to find their own voice because you bring out what's best about them. Part of the reason why I think I'm quite good at giving other people advice is because I give people the advice that I wish I'd given myself or somebody else had given me <laughs> earlier on. It's partly admitting to yourself who you are. <laughs> Many of Michael's students went on to dominate contemporary art around the world. He made us as students and all the students he taught see themselves as artists very quickly and not as students who were going to then become artists. Everything has changed so much since the early 90s. Contemporary art has gone from being a marginal concern. It was generally dismissed by most people. Now it's become the source of enormous financial speculation. Michael left his teaching post at Goldsmiths in 2000. Since then, his career has developed in characteristically unconventional directions. Recently, he's taken his work to some of the grandest and most historic locations in England. Over the past four decades, Michael Craig Martin has enjoyed a remarkable career with major retrospectives, international shows and numerous accolades. In 2014, he had one of his most extraordinary exhibitions to date at Chatsworth House in Derbyshire. The further back you put it, the smaller it gets. Michael installed a series of sculptures within the grounds. I was, I was reclining nude by the, you know, kind of nymph or something by the pond. In the house, he chose a series of playful interventions, encasing the plinths for 18th century sculptures in magenta boxes. The initial reaction is, gosh, look at all that pink, that's odd or nasty or wonderful. But very quickly, you sort of forget the pink's there. In fact, a friend of a friend walked through the gallery twice without noticing the pink. Very ordinary objects like a garden fork or a gate and they played around with the world of Chatsworth. It's interesting how the colour really picks up in the, in the greenery of the, of the landscape. And you really see the pieces very clearly. You can see them from quite a distance. The colour brings in emotion and feeling, but I didn't use colour in my work for the whole first half of my career. I was a bit frightened of colour. Then I discovered that as soon as I had no intention of making them naturalistic, then there was enormous freedom about what to do. Colour is hugely important to him. I mean, really one of the defining features of his work. It's garish, shouty, loud, poppy, very, very modern colour. A lot of it, it seems to me, is shaking us out of our inability to see the objects as quite extraordinary, because by making them extraordinary through colour, we are forced to look at them afresh. It's amazing to me that that should become seen to be mine when I see it, when I saw it as everyone's. And yet there is a kind of colour that is clearly mine. I see it myself now. Michael's audacious use of colour is no more apparent than on the walls of the Royal Academy. Here, in 2015, he was invited to coordinate what's been the highlight of Britain's artistic calendar for 240 years, the Summer Exhibition. Now this is the main gallery. I decided that it should be magenta. It's a very interesting colour. You think it shouldn't really work, but it does. It's a colour on which other th works seem to sit very comfortably. And I've never found a colour that does quite what the magenta does. He also chose the magenta room to present one of his own works. But it's not just the art that he highlighted. One of the things I think is very important is I don't think I've ever noticed the ceiling more wonderfully in here, the gold and white ceiling. Something about the break between the colour and then the ceiling, you really see the ceiling for what it is.
He now has a great grasp of colour. He has a beautiful sense of linearity, elegance and design. I can't think of an artist who can look as good in the beautiful Baroque and neoclassical confines of Chatsworth and on the walls of a white cubed space in different but equally powerful ways. With one of the busiest years on record, Michael continues to be as engaged and imaginative as ever. Now I'm in my 70s, I realise that one of the hardest things about being an artist is to sustain a creative life over a lifetime. The art world can be very cruel because you can find yourself at the centre of attention for a decade and then suddenly be frozen out completely for another decade. And you have to be able to weather those kind of, kinds of things. I keep going because I'm not at all bored with what I do, or I'm not tired of it, but I've never had a feeling that I've done what I set out to do. And that does help keep me going. After months of planning, the final preparations for the summer exhibition were underway. What I found was that the whole experience was much more interesting than I expected it to be, and it was, it was very enjoyable. I had fun doing it. The public opening was celebrated with a lavish party. For me, this was one of the most successful summer exhibitions I've ever seen, and I think actually it is in big part down to Michael Craig Martin. There's something about it that for me just says summer exhibition. It has a sense of light, of colour, of energy, which is quite a thing to create simply from painting three colours on three different sets of walls. But it also does it in a way which says Michael Craig Martin installation while not overpowering the work. I saw a glow of pink as I came around the corner and I thought, that looks exciting, I need to go there first. You're a kid in a playpen, just thinking, oh, so many colours, so many things to look at. It's really beautiful, they've done a really good job. I really liked it. It was really an adventure to see what is being done today. The whole looking at the space as a general feel is great, I think, especially the different colours and the different atmospheres that you see. I'm just really surprised at the variety of works that are on show and the quality of it. Artist, mentor, curator, writer, Michael Craig Martin is a man of many parts. Famed for his quirky yet deeply philosophical works, he continues to inspire us to open our eyes to the wonder in the everyday. He's hugely successful, probably one of the greatest living English artists that there is, but he always says to me, he's so lucky to live life doing this. What is his legacy? I think a man of very great generous spirit, a man whose influence will be rolled out in British cultural life and amongst visual culture in Britain for quite a few decades to come. I don't believe that you can plan things if you had told me, you know, 30, 40 years ago that I would be still doing work using the same drawings that I did in 1978, I would have thought you were out of your mind. But then if you had told me 20 years ago that I would be the coordinator of the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, I'd have said you were even crazier. So things change. Hyundai Motor.